Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 102 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Now, before we get into the main part of the show, I wanted to let you know about my online PR course and group coaching program, Vegans in the Limelight. It's ideal for small business owners, including authors, artists and creatives on a budget who understand the value of getting yourself or your vegan brand featured regularly in the media, but can't afford to spend thousands of dollars or pounds a month to hire a publicist or PR firm. With Vegans in the Limelight, you get access to online video training that takes you through every step of how to get media coverage that can help you generate more leads and sales, as well as grow your email list and social media following. So we cover how PR and social media work in tandem, how to research and target the media without spending a cent, how to find the stories in your vegan brand on a regular basis, How to approach journalists the right way with ideas and stories. That's a really important one. How and when to write a media release. How to create an online media room for your website without spending heaps of time or money. How to respond to journalists' call-outs or queries, which is the easiest and quickest way to get media coverage and free publicity content marketing and PR, so how to create your own shareworthy stuff and leverage it to the max, writing and content creation tips for opinion pieces, listicles, features and columns, speaking gigs and PR, so how to leverage events to gain media coverage, and interview tips for print, online, radio and TV. Now, as well as the video training, which you go through at your own pace over 12 months, the program also includes a full 12 months of group coaching, including a monthly live Q&A call. You can also post your questions throughout the year on the learning platform, and you can post your pitches and media releases and get feedback from me before you send them to journalists. So you've basically got me holding your hand, helping you to do your own PR for a full year. It's a great value program. It's way more affordable than similar courses. And it's the only one that's specifically aimed at vegan and plant-based business owners, entrepreneurs, authors, coaches, and creators. Current students have already got media coverage in mainstream and specialist newspapers, magazines, radio and TV shows, as well as blogs and podcasts. So if you'd like to get your vegan brand or yourself featured in the media, but don't have the budget to hire a publicist or PR agency, then I highly recommend you check out this program. You get full and immediate access to the materials as soon as you enroll. You can find out all the details by going to veganbusinessmedia.com and clicking on the link for the program Vegans in the Limelight. And there's also a link on the show notes page. And if you have any questions about the program, including whether it's right for you, feel free to email me at katrina at veganbusinessmedia.com. Now for the main part of the show. In this episode, I interview Ryan Bethancourt, a vegan biotech entrepreneur, investor, and one of the founders of the biohacker movement. Growing up in inner city Miami, Ryan's imagination was fueled by science fiction, and as an adult, he's focused on using science and technology to solve some of humanity's most intractable problems and reduce animal suffering. He's a co-founder, former program director and venture partner at Biotech Accelerator Program, IndieBio. Ryan has invested in more than 70 early stage biotech startups and served as the head of life sciences at the XPRIZE Foundation. His latest venture, of which he's co-founder and CEO, is Wild Earth, a pet food company that uses cultured protein to create vegan dog food. 
The company, which was started in 2014, is also working to bring a cruelty-free clean meat cat food to market. In this interview, Ryan discusses what biohacking is and how it's helping people, animals and planet, the language and messaging vegan brands need to use to get consumers on board with new technology and food, the perhaps surprising key mistake food startups make and what to do instead, why an idea is not enough and what else you need to get investors and partners on board for your business, why he thinks business plans are dead and what you need instead, how to choose the right accelerator program for startups, the three questions he asks entrepreneurs before deciding whether to invest in them, why he chose to go the venture capital investment route for Wild Earth, and much more. Here's the interview with Ryan Bethancourt, vegan biohacker, investor, and co-founder of Wild Earth. Hello, Ryan. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Katrina. Now, I'm very excited to interview you. You're the first biohacker I think I've ever spoken to, let alone had on the podcast. So I'm really excited and I know you're going to have some great things to share with, with our audience. Um, so the first question I always ask everybody on the show that I kick off with is the why. So you've funded and you've been involved with a number of groundbreaking biotech businesses. So can you just say a little bit about what are your drivers and reasons for doing what you do? Yeah, so so I think I think there are two drivers. Um, one um, it actually stems back to my childhood. Um, you know, I, I kind of uh, grew up in um, in inner city Miami. Uh, it was kind of a rough, uh, you know, kind of neighborhood childhood. Um, and uh, you know, I really I saw science and science science fiction was my kind of my avenue out of a lot of the issues that were happening in the um, you know where I lived and and, and where I was growing up. And it, it kind of fueled my imagination as to how we could use science and technology to, to, to better the human condition. Um, that was, I would say that's my primary driver. Um, I'm also an ethical vegan. And so for me, um, you know, I looked around me and I saw all of the things that we were doing with, with animals and animal agriculture. And I was like, well, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, why can't we use science to remove the animals? Like, why do we have to have sentient beings, you know, um, uh, by the billions, um, getting used for their bodies when we can actually use biotech to like remove that and, and obviously reduce a whole lot of suffering around the world. So, you know, my, my passion, my why is uh, I think we can use science to reduce suffering um, for both humans and for animals as well. I, wow, I love that. And I was just thinking about science. I wish we could clone you and, <laughs> and just have loads and loads of people yeah. like you. Like, <laughs> yeah, sure, I really sure. love that. And, and I love what you said about the, the science fiction as well, because I think that's really important, you know, for, for young people, for children. Like you said, it was an escape. But then I love how you've, you've used that um, in, in a practical way as well. I think it's absolutely lovely. So thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. <laughs> so we, we mentioned the biohacker. So look, I had to, admittedly, when I wrote the article for Forbes about you, I did have to Google biohacker. I actually wasn't quite sure what it meant. And I think some of our audience might not know. So I think it would be great. Could you explain to us in your own words, what exactly is a biohacker? Yeah. So, so there are a few different, um, uh, you know, as, as with uh, like a lot of these kind of common um, kind of more cultural references, uh, there are a few different terms for biohackers. Uh, some people talk about biohacking your body. So, um, you know, doing things to your body. Uh, that's not the type of biohacker that I am. I'm, 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 I'm open to augmenting uh, bodies. Uh, I actually call that uh, medicine, the practice of medicine. So and we can probably dive a little bit deeper into, you know, why I think that medicine is actually a really interesting avenue for uh, augmenting, you know, bodies as they fail. But, but really biohacking uh, what it means to me and for many other people who I think are very aligned with me is that biohacking is the use of low cost biotechnology to do interesting things, to create new products, new services, uh, or, or just, just as a way of learning more about nature and the world around us. Um, and so, so bio, the, the biohacking movement um, emerged probably around 2008, 2009. Um, and there were a whole bunch of us who were basically buying uh, equipment from bankrupt biotech companies for literally pennies on the dollar uh, in Silicon Valley, in, in Los Angeles, in New York, and actually now globally, um, including actually in, in Australia, in Sydney, and in Melbourne as well. Um, 
you know, basically creating shared community labs where access to tools that were previously out of our reach were possible. So, so, so citizens, so citizen scientists could actually do science. And for me, that was incredibly exciting because, you know, as, as a scientist, sometimes I would struggle to get access to um, some tools and some technologies that are typically only in large corporations or academia. And we can make these Kind of communal spaces, these biohacking spaces available to everyone. And so, you know, we had a lot of really incredible um, projects we were able to do. Um, one of the projects that I was involved in, in starting was the Open Insulin Project. So it was this idea that uh, actually insulin around the world is still expensive. And could we, could we make an open source version, you know, essentially a bacteria that would make insulin where, where people could, could grow it themselves, scale it in a, in a bioreactor and actually make their own homegrown insulin. Wow, yeah, we're, a little, we're we're still a little far from the purification of that and and the quality control aspect, but but the proof of principle is something that we did. We showed that we could actually do that, right? Um, and that was something that we did. I mean, there were probably I would say twenty to thirty people who were involved. Everything from PhD level scientists to doctors to uh, citizen scientists, uh, and and of course to interesting enough to diabetic patients themselves as well. So uh, Antine DeFranco. Uh, who, who heads up the project, the Open Open Insulin Project? Um, he himself is a type one diabetic, and wow. you know it, it was shocking to him. He was having to pay you know five hundred dollars a month uh, for all of his insulin, where whereas you know insulin is essentially generic, and so it just doesn't make sense. That he has to pay so much, and so there's still parts of the world where people can't access insulin, a life saving medicine. Um, okay. so we want to I can't imagine the drug companies are very like kind of like what you're no. doing. I mean, I love what you do. It's <laughs> brilliant. Like I can imagine them being really annoyed. Um, I love that. This sounds amazing. Um, now, a lot of what you've done as well, it's been in the food space, and I, I think this is an interesting question because literally only recently I got an email from a uh, a vegan meat brand, um, mm -hmm. basically saying, "Look, people don't want um, technology in their food. You know, they mm -hmm. don't need these vegan meats to bleed and all this kind of thing. And they basically they want more." natural so i'm curious about what are your thoughts on how can brands who are working in this space you know vegan plant-based brands that are working in this space how can they convey the innovation and get the public to embrace biotech and food so i you know i think it's a really interesting conversation so um you know when you look at at what is what is food what is agriculture i think it's it's really easy to fall for what, what we often call the naturalistic fallacy anything that, that's natural is good um, but when you start to look at agriculture what is actually natural? So if you take classical, let's say organic agriculture, we grow clones in a field, right? Let's say you're growing wheat or corn or, or any of these other plants. We grow them in an artificially irrigated field. Um, and these are clones. And then we basically harvest them. Then we, we plow them into the ground and then start the harvest all over again. It's not natural. Um, it's it's 10,000 year old technology. That, that's really what it is. Um, and, and all of these, all of the crops that we eat today have been uh, bred by our ancestors and tailored to be more nutritious, bigger, um, less toxic. Um, and so, so, so really food and agriculture is already a technology. Um, but, but people, you know, I, I think it's just a natural reaction. If something new, it's like, well, it's unknown. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think we have to, and, and I think personally as scientists, we have to, to be super clear with the public on you know what are the benefits like i think you know one of the mistakes that uh, a company like monsanto made is that they were like oh well we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna save a few a few dollars or a few shillings you know uh by by making these uh, bt crops you know bt soy or or roundup ready soy or corn um it, it didn't communicate any benefits so it was all all risk for the consumer and no no benefits like what well, right. Right, what's in it for me? Like, okay, now you've got something weird in my food. I don't know what it is or why it's important. And, and, and you're making more money, but this, this actually has no benefit for me. I just want to eat, you know, my, you know, my corn or my, my soy um, uh, without weird stuff in it. And so, you know, I think that the, the benefit where you look at a company like Impossible Foods, when they're adding these engineered heme, the, the heme uh, is actually engineered in a, in a, in a yeast uh, and it comes from soy, but it's actually a, a product of, of genetic engineering, um, you know, there's a real benefit there. It's like, hey, you can have the taste and the flavor that you enjoy from a, from a beef burger, but it doesn't actually come uh, from, a ca from, from an animal. It's more sustainable from an environmental perspective. Uh, there were no animals that were harmed. You know, it's cruelty-free. 
um, you know, and it saves water and, and resources and all this other sort of stuff. So I think if there's consumer benefit, um, you know, it's, it can be a very powerful thing. And so, so that's when, when I, you know, the companies that I've funded that I've been involved with in funding, uh, you know, both through IndieBio and continuing to support um, post IndieBio, um, you know, that, those, that's the conversation. I, I try and encourage all of the founders that I work with uh, to really be open and honest with the public and, and talk about things, even if it's controversial, why not? Like, just yeah. be honest. Yeah, right? yeah, now that makes sense. It's all about the messaging. And yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Even for me as a consumer, like that totally makes sense to hear that. And it's interesting what you said. Yeah, I hadn't thought about, you know, the, the food that we eat now, like you said, the, the crops or the grain or whatever, actually being a technology. And you're, you're quite right. So you're certainly getting me thinking as well. So, um, so like we said, you, you've worked with many, many startups and innovative businesses in the life sciences sector. And you've provided both actual help as well as funding through IndieBio and other accelerated programs. So can you talk us through what are some of the key mistakes you see startups making and what should they do instead yeah so i think so so there are a couple of really interesting ideas so so one of the big mistakes i think that science-based startups tend to make um uh, and this applies to food-based startups so you know whether it's uh clean meat related or whether it's uh i think they're calling it a cellular agriculture so so companies that make um uh, uh, protein products that were originally derived from animals but now they make an engineered yeast or bacteria uh, or whether you're just talking about plant-based foods that are basically like uh, material innovations or, or biochemistry-based innovations, is that they don't think big enough. So often, I think that the fear that founders have is that people won't believe them if they say, hey, we're going to transform the world with, uh, you know, clean meat, right? Uh, you know, one example, finless food. You know, we're going to transform the world and we're going to feed the world, uh, sustainably feed the world with fish, right? Um, I, you know, it sounds grandiose. It sounds almost impossible, but the reality of it is, uh, it moves people. It inspires people. Um, and so, you know, I think that if there's any recommendation I can have for for founders, for startup founders, for people who have a mission in the world, um, is to to be bold, like to do the thing that scares them, to say the thing that scares them, which is like, hey, I want to save the oceans, and to do that, uh, we're going to have to provide people with delicious, sustainable seafood. Uh, that doesn't get pulled out of the oceans. Uh, and we're going to find a way to do that, even if I don't know every single step to get us there. Mm. Um, so yeah. I, would say, I would say that, you know, be bold. Like, be really, really bold and say, you know, if it's possible, obviously, you know, don't, don't go into a fantasy world. Uh, look at the science <laughs> of today and see how you can adapt the science of today or the science of nearly today. Um, take a risk. Do something that's a little, there's a chance of failure because you never know you might succeed. Mm, um, yeah, I love that. I love that. But that's an interesting one because I, I love the philosophy of that. But then the, there can be kind of people who go, oh, I've got this great idea. But then they've literally kind of like they have no perhaps business experience or they have no idea to take the next step. They've maybe literally got an idea and no money and what have you. And I often get contacted by people saying, oh, I've got this great idea. Can you put me in touch with an investor? I don't have any money, but I'm, do you know what I mean? And it, it's yeah, tricky. Exactly. I guess kind of, so at what point does say a startup know, that kind of leads nicely into my next question. At what point does a startup know that it say ready to perhaps you know get some help say to join an accelerator program yeah. or yeah. to seek an investment so so i would say i think a lot of those and i, I uh, katrina i get contacted by uh some you know uh, some kind of mission motivated founders like that as well who have this idea and they're like oh i have an idea um and you know it'll be amazing once i make it but i just need money uh yeah. to go, <laughs> to do this and uh you know and, and basically like pretty much everything else other than the idea right um and it's like Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> I bet you get lots of those. That idea, right? But an idea itself is not enough. And so, you know, it's really important to say, you know, uh, investors and people who want to help you on your mission have to see that you're going to continue to move forward regardless, right? So you need to, to have a real plan on how you get from an idea to a prototype to a product to something that you can scale and sell. Ultimately, a business is, 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 um, is a company which creates a product or service that you sell to a customer who uh, really, really wants your product. You have to have these kind of true believers, uh, people who want to buy this product. Uh, the term that I use is foaming at the mouth. It's probably not a great analogy, but they have to be so excited about your product <laughs> that they're willing to do almost anything because at first your product probably won't be perfect. Um, and I think one other really important point, I think when, you know, potential founders or people who want to build businesses, especially mission motivated businesses is 
ask the honest question, is this a real business, right? Um, you know, basically saying, hey, I want to be the, you know, the, the, two, the, the 200th company making a new type of, uh, uh, I don't know, um, tofu burger. Is that a real business? Are people going to get excited about that? Do you really know the market? Is this something that is the market is truly looking for and asking for, or is it just is it just that you want to build something and you you don't really know where to start, so you just decided, oh, I'll start here because I know this space. Um, sure. Not not all businesses are not all businesses are businesses that are going to be venture funded. In fact, the minority are. Um, if you're going to build a business, make sure that you have a very solid use case, and ideally, don't try and build a business unless you would build that business even if no one funded you or believed in you. Mm, that's a really good piece of advice. I love that. <laughs> I really like that. So at what point then, when would a startup know that say, okay, or when you said, well, let's go back a bit, you said that basically people need a plan. So to like show the project. So do you mean they need a good, strong, say business plan, say on paper or on, you know, electronics, or do you mean that they should actually somehow or other like create some kind of prototype? So what exactly would, would you want to see to say, okay, this person is really serious? So, so I, I will officially call the, the business plan dead, right? And so I've come across this. I've had people send me business plans that are like 30 or 40 page business plans. And I'm like, I'm like you've spent literally, you know, days of your life uh, putting this together. And it's a dead document the moment it's made, right? Because the world is constantly changing. And so what I advise early stage founders is put together like a concept sheet, like a one or two page thing. Um, the, the opportunity should be very clear to you uh, and then try and start building it, like build a prototype. If you, if you think you can make, you know, the best vegan burger out there or the best, you know, plant-based burger, obviously I know wording is, is important. Um, and, and it's just like the tastiest thing ever, like do that. And then, and then show people, prove to people that it's the tastiest. Go and say, Hey, you don't have to believe me. Just try it, sample it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I think that, that um, showing people by doing is the most powerful thing. Uh, and people and, could do that even if they like don't have much money. Like they could even do that, like say beginning at the very early stages, maybe in a, a shared kitchen or even a home kitchen. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, th there's nothing stopping you. Give. So this is another piece of advice that um, that I that I love because it's so true. Give yourself the permission. Realize a lot of us, you know, wait for someone else to give us permission to start building something or to start you know, creating our vision of what we want in the world, uh, no one's going to give you permission other than yourself. Mm. So we can, right? Start and mm. find a way. I love it. That's brilliant. Really, really good advice. So when, if someone does get into a, an accelerator program, so they've got to a stage um, where they think they, they maybe want to apply to something like IndieBuy or, or, or some kind of accelerator program, what kind of process is involved there and what help do they get if, if yeah. and when they're accepted? Yeah, so the, the, so the, the good thing is there are now a lot of really amazing accelerators. I would say that you know when we started um, when we started IndieBio maybe maybe four ish years ago, uh, there were fewer accelerators in the kind of future of food space. But now there's some excellent accelerators out there. Uh, you know, there's Rebel Bio, there's YC Bio, uh, Y Combinator has now has a, a bio focus, um, and I know Sam Altman, who's who's the president of Y Combinator, is super excited about biotech focused companies. He's been funding future food companies as well as more classical biotech companies. And there, there are actually um, there are a whole bunch of uh, investment funds that are out there that actually are willing to back entrepreneurs. So like Veg Invest. Yes, I've had Jody on the show actually. Yeah, Jody, yeah. Great. Great. yeah. You know, Blue Horizon. You know, there's some really incredible mission motivated uh, investors out there who who want to help entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what advice would I give uh, a founder? L look, look at the accelerators um, and see if they've funded the types of companies that you want to build, right? So, um, and, 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 and look at the particular people who would be involved. Like ask, you know, if you're in London, uh, I, I know that there's, um, there's like an accelerator called uh, Entre Entrepreneurs uh, First. Um, like talk to them, say, you know, talk to the partners and say, hey, I have this vision of, you know, this company that I want to build. Um, how do you think you guys could, could support me? Um, and, and they'll be very honest. They'll say, these are the places where we can help you. These are the places where we can. And so you, you may have to make a decision. Well, okay, I need additional skill sets. Um, you know, I'm a business person or I'm a, I'm a scientist or I'm a food person, but I need other skill sets. And then you, you basically bring people into your founding team that can help you with those skill sets. No one is an island. 
Um, and so I highly recommend anyone to not start a company as a sole founder. Always start a company with at least one other person who is complementary to you, not identical to you, but someone who, you know, if you're not detail orientated, find someone that is to start a company with that balances you and your weaknesses and your strengths. Mm, yeah, I know that makes sense. So if you were getting an application, what, what makes a successful app? Because I imagine lots of people must apply for these, these programs mm-hmm. and not everyone's going to get in. So what makes a successful application stand out? They do. So, so I'll, I'll kind of highlight very simply um, what, what makes a successful application. So first is, um, you know, is this so crazy that it's not real? Or, or is this idea something that seems actually kind of feasible? You know, it could, and, and the way that I assess that when it comes to science-based companies is I look at the scientific literature and I look to see if there's at least a couple of examples of uh, scientific findings that would lead me in the same direction. And so if I see that, you know, three to five different scientific papers actually point to what this founder is saying uh, is feasible. Um, you know, like one, one of the things with Geltor, when they, um, when, they, when they applied to us to get funding, and Geltor is the company that brews uh, uh, gel- uh, collagen and gelatin, so animal-free uh, gelatin uh, in bacteria. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of the company itself. Um, when they applied, they basically, um, you know, at first they had an idea around, you know, using the, the bacteria as a protein production platform, but then they came up with the idea of actually making collagen, which I thought was brilliant because there's there's a great market to start in collagen for, you know, the beauty space, but then they could move into, you know, replacing the gelatin in gummy bears. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so so there's clearly a market need, there's a differentiator. So you start first with the science. Is the science credible? The the answer for Geltor was yes, their science was credible. And in fact they actually showed us uh, their science. So so it was even more it was even more than credible, right? They they showed us they could actually do what they said they could do um, on the science end. And then the then the second question is okay, is this a real business? Is this a business that's targeting a large, usually a billion dollar plus market? Um, you know, if the answer is yes, then, then that, that's, that's, that's something that's incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. If it's not a billion dollars, is it so impactful that you would be, you know, a significant player in, in a smaller industry that could be worth doing too. Um, and then finally, I think the third question that I ask is how about the team? Are these credible people? And this is actually a really important thing. You have to be really honest with yourself and with your co-founders. Um, you know, if you want to create a clean meat company, but no one on your team is a scientist, how do you know that you are the right team <laughs> members to actually do this, right? Yeah. Um, if you don't have those team members, maybe add them on and get a credible person that can actually do it. Maybe a tissue engineering scientist, you know, PhD scientist who did tissue engineering. Like, that's okay. You can do that. Mm, got it. No, that's really good advice. It's well, brilliant. Fantastic. So investing in, in any business, I guess, as, from an investor point of view, it's mm-hmm. risky. And I, I guess the tech industry um, itself has a, a bit of a reputation for being even more risky because it's focused on innovation. And as we talked about earlier, concepts that have perhaps not yet been seen, let alone proved before. Um, and they offer sometimes they, they require large amounts of money, which we're seeing, I guess, in the, the, the cultured lab meat, to the clean yeah. meat. So yeah. how did and do you decide which companies to invest in so it, it's it's always i mean for me personally so i would say i um i tend to be more risk embracing um and so uh, you know i i personally looked into venture capital business the history of venture capital the history of innovation um and and when you look at and when you look at outcomes um you know there's a baseball analogy uh, that that i really love which is this is a home run business so the vast amount of returns by venture capital companies are actually made uh, on some of the riskiest um, uh, companies when they first when they first launched. I mean, if you if you kind of listen to the story of Airbnb, um, it, back when Airbnb was funded by Y Combinator in the early days, it was far from clear that anyone wanted to uh, have random strangers stay in their living room uh, and pay them for it. Right, <laughs> so that was actually a business was just kind of mind blowing back then. But but they they believed in the entrepreneurs and they thought the concept was really interesting. And so they backed it. That was a highly risky yeah. bet. Uh, but it turned into a multi, multi billion dollar investment as a result of embracing that risk. And so so there are different investors and different types of risk profiles. I would say that I embrace, you know, high risk, high return. I think that that is a strategy that I, you know, I personally am excited about. And that's the, that's the end of the spectrum where I, you know, 
I'm probably an interesting person to talk to. I'm probably not an interesting person if you, you know, if you want to, 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 to save money in stocks and bonds. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm not an interest. Like I, I'm, I'm interesting from a venture capital perspective and someone who, who believes that science and um, uh, science and cutting edge business ideas and business models are the way to, to build the future. Got um, it. Got it. Now that makes sense. So how much in that case then, so when you invest in a company, how much mm-hmm. involvement do you have with them? Like I, I'm assuming you're perhaps not just one of these people who, you know, I, I guess there's people who are passive investors. So they're like, yep, here you go. Here's the cash off. You go and do it. And then, you know, you wait for your returns to come in. And then there's people who are more kind of hands-on investors. So mm-hmm. just curious about how much involvement you have with the companies that you've invested in. So, yeah. So, so in the, in the early days, I would definitely say, um, you know, while I and Ron, uh, and Arvin were, were at Indie Bio, um, I would say that I was, I personally was incredibly hands-on, um, you know, seven days a week, I was working with the company. So during the accelerator program, I would work with them, um, on their business plans, on pitching, on fundraising, on building their business, on sales and marketing. Um, it's something that I, I personally love. I love being a very hands-on uh, investor. Um, I would say now as more of a series, a series seed and series A investor with Babel Ventures, um, I'm a little bit less hands-on, but I still, I'd probably say I'm much more of a hands-on uh, investor when, when we invest through Babel Ventures. And then as an entrepreneur, switching hats, um, it's, I, I personally like both styles of investors. I like investors that I can go to and ask advice, and that's a style of investor. Um, and then there are investors that are, are, are much more hands-on. They'll come and visit you. They'll come and find out what you need. Uh, they'll help connect you with certain people. Um, you know, Felicis Ventures, uh, which is one of our lead investors, uh, they're leading Silicon Valley venture capital firm. They've been a phenomenal investor, right? I mean, they, they basically, uh, so, Sony Arison and, and Aiden and, and the whole team over at Felicis have, have been incredibly helpful when there are moments where, uh, you know, we need a, an advisor or I need feedback on, you know, how do you build a high growth company? Um, they'll get involved. Uh, when I don't need it, they'll kind of step back and let me run the business. So I appreciate that. And I think, you know, it just depends on what type of investor you want. Yeah. So, and I guess it comes down to yeah, making sure you get the right investor is really important um, yeah. so that you, you get what you need at the different stages. So I like that you've, you've shared that. In terms of the, some of the companies that you've um, you funded and that have been successful, and then obviously, you know, there have probably been some that you've, you've funded that there haven't been. With the ones that have been successful, what, would, what was it that you think made them successful while others failed? So they might have all been great ideas, but obviously some of them have cut through and been very successful while others kind of maybe fell by the wayside what's been key to their success do you think yeah i mean i would i would definitely say um so so i would say the if i if i parse through the probably 70 companies that i've been uh that i've funded and through various different you know uh either indie buyer or babble ventures or or personally as an angel investor which i've done very little of but i've done some um you know i would say that the founders that are um open have kind of a beginner's mind, um, have been the most successful. And, and I say that it's, I, I know it's kind of a very kind of Buddhist perspective, but I've just noticed that, that founders that are willing to, to take in all of the information and deal with the tr- truth as it is, not as they wish it, are much more responsive uh, as you build a business. There's a lot of chaos when you build a business. It's like, you know, a lot of people <laughs> liken it to, you know, jumping off of a cliff and then you parachute on the way down, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's scary. It's uncertain. Um, it's all of these things, and it's super exciting. Um, and and those founders that have been able to deal with all of that chaos by saying, "Okay, I know that I don't know. So how do I how do I start finding? Out? How do I?" And and those founders, you know, there's some founders that are, you know have been incredible to work with. You know, I'll give you some examples like um, uh, like Uma from Memphis Meats, right? So Uma, the CEO of Memphis Meats. Uh, he has this very steady approach to uncertainty where he basically goes, okay, let me understand everything and then I'll make my own decisions. Um, uh, Alex from Geltor, uh, he learns incredibly quickly and he listens. Um, you know, uh, non-food-based companies, um, I would say, you know, one of, one of the more uh, interesting companies uh, would be, um, uh, let me see, catalog technologies. They store digital data in, in DNA, right? And Hun Jun uh, is a very thoughtful guy. He's always listening. Um, uh, let's see, another one, uh, New Way Foods. Dominique, uh, the CEO of New Way Foods. Oh, made- yeah, they did the shrimp, yeah, didn't they? they did the the vegan shrimp. Right. And 
yeah. she learned how to build a business, right? Her and Michelle uh, Wolf, like they, they learned how to build a business. They learned how to sell. They learned how to, how to build a consumer products, good business. I mean, you know, th- this is not trivial stuff and, and it, it all comes from, you know, being very humble when you build businesses. And so, so the one trend that I've seen is, is very humble founders. Uh, if you approach things from a humble perspective, uh, I, I love those types of founders. I would love to work with them. I would love to be employed by them. I would love to back them, you know, it just all around, you know, looking at it from both an entrepreneur perspective and an investor perspective. Got it. Got it. Now that makes sense. Really, really good advice. This is wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about your latest venture, your new company, um, which I wrote about for, for Forbes and we'll put, we can put a link to that as well. So people can find out a bit more. So you founded Wild Earth, which is a biotech pet food company yeah. using cultured proteins. And you've kicked off with uh, a vegan, uh, dog food that's made from um, a, 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 an ancient relative of the mushroom, I believe. So yeah. tell me, what made you decide to say be CEO of the company and actually found it rather than just an investor? Yeah, so, so I, I was looking for a long time. So I'm a big time animal lover. I've been a pet parent over, over the years. Uh, at the moment, I currently, uh, I do a lot of fostering with Rocket Dog Shelter uh, and uh, with Rocket Dog. And, you know, Every time I'd open up a can of meat or I'd, I'd serve the, you know, the dogs the, that I had kibble, I was always like, you know, I would, I don't think I would, I don't, I wouldn't eat this food. Uh, you know, why, why am I serving it to my, to, you know, to my pets? And, uh, you know, I was like, there must be a better way. And so, you know, for a long time, I'd been kind of looking and waiting for a company to try and do it at a cost effective way to actually do clean meat. Um, and it just became clear to me that clean meat is something that's coming one day. Uh, but it probably won't be the first market, right? It, we'll probably see clean meat uh, in human food first before we see it in, in pet food. Um, but then, you know, uh, Ron, Ron Shigeta, my co-founder, multiple times over, um, about four times over now, um, he, uh, he, he was always driving me crazy. Wherever we were, he always had Koji with him, right? So when we were at Berkeley <laughs> Biolabs, we had, a little, we had a little refrigerator, and sometimes the Koji would, would actually, because it was a fungi, it would actually get into the, to the bacterial plates or the or the animal cell plates and they would just take over and it would grow really quickly but he would actually uh use the koji for sauces and marinades and various other things he would use it for cooking um and i was like i would always I would say ron you know you have to be careful with that stuff it grows really quickly and really easily uh so we need to be careful and uh and it just came to me and i was like it's an edible quick growing uh uh protein clean protein i was like why why don't why don't i change the way that i think about what what cultured cells are, um, and actually start start thinking about how we could potentially do something you know differently on, in this respect. And so um, you know, and then so that that's really when Wild Earth was born. I talked to Ron about it. Um, he and I uh, kind of got together, and we were like, okay, well, we're going to do this for the fourth time now. We're going to try and build something new. He was excited about it too, um, you know. And and really, there were no, as far as we were aware, there were really no leaders in the future of food. Uh, in the pet food space, right? So we really wanted to become the future of food company uh, for pets. Um, it's a huge market just in the U.S. alone, um, but globally, it's a huge and rising market. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, so so we thought, and not only that, there was a huge need. Whereas, whereas food, uh, especially in the West, for us, uh, the food supply is actually pretty good. Um, you know, it's it's rare for people to get really sick. Uh, eating just norm, eating normal food uh, in the West and uh, developing countries and emerging economies. That's actually different. Um, food supply is an issue. Um, but, but in the pet food industry, uh, actually in the U S we had a recall of uh, 180, uh, 100 and I think it was 108 million cans of wow. dog food recalled. Of what? Sorry. Uh, of dog food. Dog oh, food. Right. That's right. Did, was it that the one where it had the, the, the phenobarbital the, um, it in it that used it to, to euthanize animals? Oh, my God. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, which brings up a whole bunch of questions, right? It brings up the question, like, what was actually in that food? It probably was not farm animals. It was probably some other animal that was euthanized. Some oh. people speculated that, you know, could it be horses? Could it be actually dogs and cats from shelters? Oh, we, God. We, we don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, this is not good food, right? If it's contaminated with euthanasia drug that's made many animals sick. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was, it's very clear. And then there've been issues around salmonella and some other, you know, issues around the plastic in, in the actual, in, in pet food. Um, and so it just became very clear. It was like, this is a space where actually we could make food 
safer and better for our companions. Um, and we could do it cost effectively with the Koji. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, so that's really what led to, to the idea. Got it, got it. And I know that you're also uh, looking to do um, cultured, like clean meat for cats, for example, yes. with the, yeah. the mouse meat. It's actually quite exciting what you're doing, particularly in that sort of um, uh, arena as it's coming through. So what were some of your challenges? I know the company's still quite new. It's only about six months or so old. But what were some of your challenges that you faced when you first started the company and how did you, you handle them? Yes, yeah, so one of the biggest challenges is actually perception. So um, I think a lot of people, when we, we basically talked about using an alternative protein, uh, like koji as, as a fungi, who were like, oh, well, no, 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 you have to feed uh, pets meat, right? In the case of, you know, in the case of dogs, dogs are actually omnivores, uh, cats are obligate carnivores, but we think we can have a solution for both dogs and cats. Uh, obviously, koji for, for the dogs, um, and, and we make sure, obviously, they'll have all the amino acids and multivitamins and minerals that are required for their for, for the pet food. Uh, and then for cats, you know, we thought, you know, clean, clean meat and cultured, uh, cultured meat is actually the way to go to provide them with, with some of the meat, you know, uh, it is still possible to supplement it and, and provide the taurine and the carnitine that the cats need, um, without having to provide meat. But we just thought that, uh, for, for the pet parents, it would actually be much more reassuring to actually say, eh, no, no, there actually is meat, but it's, it's slaughter free, right? Cruelty free, slaughter free, uh, meat. And so, so that's really, you know, the cultured meat is, is a little further out. Um, that, that will be a challenge to bring to market, but it's something that we're working on and we've made some. Um, the perception of, the, uh, of, of essentially meat-free uh, uh, pet food, uh, I think has been one of the bigger challenges. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's still like an educational perspective. It's like, how do I know that it's safe and healthy for my pets? That, that's almost always the question that we get. And that's, that's actually why we're working with uh, our chief veterinarian officer, Ernie Ward, and also a veterinary nutritionist to make sure it's crafted in the right way. Um, we, we definitely don't recommend homemade meals because uh, homemade meals compared to um, even some of the kibble and some of the other products that are actually nutritionally balanced, make sure that pets have like all, all the vitamins and minerals and protein they need. Uh, some of the homemade meals, you just can't guarantee that, right? Is there enough protein in the homemade meal? Is there enough vitamins, the right vitamins? Um, that's something that, that, that is still, you know, challenging. Uh, and I know lots of pet parents, including myself, by the way, will occasionally make something, you know, homemade meal, but it's important to make sure you know, pets get enough the, the right nutrients as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I know that makes sense. So in terms of how Wild Earth is funded, um, as much as you're comfortable sharing, how is it funded and why did you choose that particular method? Yeah, so, so you know, we're, we're funded, uh, we raised $4 million uh, from uh, uh, several VCs. Felicis Ventures is our, our lead VC firm with uh, Stray Dog and, and Veg Invest. Um, uh, but we've also raised from... Uh, Several several uh, high net worth individuals who really back our cause. Uh, some of which you know um, would prefer not not to be mentioned. But yeah, of course, a lot of, a lot, a lot of great uh, great mission focused uh, backers. Uh, the reason that we really chose to go the venture capital route rather than trying to to fund and build the company organically is that we really think that we can create a huge business um, that transforms uh, positively the world in terms of the you know. Uh, the impact on the environment, on CO2 production, uh, you know, uh, water contamination, reducing all of these things, efficient use of natural resources, uh, and then, of course, you know, reducing, hopefully, tens of millions of, of animals that are currently slaughtered for, for pet food, we think that we can, we can actually remove that from the equation. And right. that's something I'm personally passionate about. Yeah, and you wanted to get it going and getting going quicker i'm assuming yeah, as well yeah exactly. I'm, I'm passionate about impact right so i yeah. you know i think we could definitely grow this organically over a period of time but um you know we don't have time and yeah. to be honest you know our pets don't have time uh based on on the um you know the quality of the food currently that they're they're eating and and the animals that are being used in the industrial agriculture system you know i mean literally billions of animals are slaughtered every year and so they also don't have time Got it. Got it. So final couple of questions in terms, and this is one I ask everyone as well, because I think, and there's no right or wrong answers. I just love getting people's perspectives. The use of the word vegan in a company's marketing materials, you know, whether that's their website or, you know, on their branding, on their packaging, if it's a product, um, there's two schools of thought. One, you know, it scares people off. Um, and the other is, no, it's, it's actually a good thing to put on now. Um, so tell us a little bit about what your thoughts on that generally. Um, and in regards to how you've positioned Wild Earth in, in 
in, in that as well. And what advice you could offer to biotech startups in particular, but could also apply to other startups in, in the use of the word vegan or not? Yeah, so it's actually you know very timely because this is something that I, I actually do struggle with. So I'm a very passionate uh, vegan myself. Uh, and, and actually, uh, several, several of my team members, my co-founders are also vegan themselves. We also have, you know, omnivore co-founders as well. Um, and, you know, we've looked at this. And what's interesting is that when we use, you know, the, the word vegan is a very powerful word. Uh, for those of us that are vegans, it really resonates with us. Um, for, um, for non-vegans, it can feel very exclusionary. Um, and, and it's really interesting when you start to look at it. it, it you know, I don't view it as an exclusionary word. Uh, but a lot of people react very negatively to the to the use of the word vegan. So, um, you know, kind of I think the compromise that we've gotten to is that, you know, we are going to talk about our 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 food. While there's food is not we're not viewing it as a vegan dog food or a vegan cat food. We're viewing it as a cleaner uh, food source for our pets, better for the environment, better for all the animals. Um, but that that's really the wording that we're going for because we've tested it, and what we found is that um, we actually uh, get unnecessary negative attention from the broader market, not just our fellow vegans, but from the broader market. And so, you know, we think we can create the change in the world that we want to see. If that means we end up not using a word, which I personally like, which is using the word vegan, um, then we'll do that because we're, we're focused on impact. Yeah, got it. No, it makes total sense. So final question, um, Ryan, what's your long-term vision or plans for Wild Earth? Any other companies that you're involved with and yourself? Okay, well, so, so I can answer that in a couple of <laughs> I know it's a bit of a big question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a really big question. So, you know, so I, I'll answer it. I guess maybe, uh, you know, starting starting very very big, right? Um, which is kind of my broader um, viewpoint, um, which is interlinked with where I think the world can go. So, I'm actually very optimistic about where the world and where we're going. I think the world in general is getting better. I mean, there are obviously various different political. Uh, social, economic issues going all over the world. And, and obviously, uh, the world is not yet sa a safe place for, for most of the world's population, but, but it's getting better, um, and, and including, obviously, the animals as well. Um, but, you know, I really view biology as a technology that can move our world forward from one of scarcity. You know, people, people don't have enough to eat. Um, we, we use animals in ways that most people would probably prefer we don't. Uh, but but we, we're reliant on that. And so I think we can convert our world from a world of scarcity to one of abundance, uh, embracing biotechnology. So I think that biology can turn literally sugar uh, into all sorts of products, um, you know, whether, whether we're talking about food, uh, whether we're talking about biomaterials like alternatives to leather or even spider silk, which is 10 times stronger than steel, all the way through to consumer applications like using uh, biological neurons for computation. And so you know, my vision is that we use biology to literally build our world um, and, and also reduce, uh, reduce the, uh, the environmental footprint that we have all across the world using biology. Um, and so, so, you know, from scarcity to abundance, that's where I start. Um, you know, the broader worldview, a lot of people have talked about, you know, um, the high quality, low cost protein that we're creating at Wild Earth. I think that's something that um, clearly... Um, is valuable not just to um, not just to pets, but I think you know to the world itself. Um, we have this vision of how do we make this this quality protein accessible to billions of people. Uh, if you know if I if I'm allowed to dream, that's where my dream goes, right? I, I think how can we make sure that everyone on this planet uh, eats a healthy, nutritious meal uh, every day, um, and and that you know that includes you know our pets, uh, but then also uh, all of our fellow humans as well. Mm. It's interesting because I'm, I'm curious because some of that's going to require, I guess, kind of government buy-in or, you know, buy-in from, I guess, the, the corporate sector. Is, do you think that's the kind of what, do you think that's the, the, how it's going to happen? Because we know that, you know, the meat dairy industries get huge subsidies, whereas plant-based companies haven't really had the benefit of that. Do you think it's going to come from that, like, you know, getting like governments on board and what have you, or is it going to be down to say, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, vision focused entrepreneurs and mission driven entrepreneurs such as yourself? Yeah, I, I think it ultimately, I think that um, we have to rely on ourselves to create the change we want to see in the world, right? So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, it, for, for your listeners, and, and I know, uh, Katrina, you're, you're very heavily involved in making this a reality as well yourself. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't really believe in the power of governments. Um, I don't believe in the power of nonprofits. I believe in the power of people and entrepreneurs uh, to change the world for the better. 
So I'm yeah. a big fan, uh, you know, of Elon Musk. Um, you know, the space industry literally uh, was stifled, and it was really a competition between uh, large, you know, large, large governments. And uh, Elon Musk came in and disrupted it. You know, he did the same thing for electric cars. I mean, electric cars were dead until Elon Musk came back and said, actually, we could make a great looking electric car. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we can apply that same rationale, that same way of thinking uh, to, to food, to our environmental impact on the world. It's like, yeah, carbon, you know, uh, our carbon footprint is going up. So how can we, how can we mitigate that? You know, yeah. people want to eat meat. How do we, how do we, how do we change that? I guess it's the pushback, you know, from the industry because these are really powerful industries. You know, like you say, like the, the oil industries. You know, they're not going to be too happy with electric cars, and you know, a lot of the the you know the farmers or the the meat and dairy animal ag industries are maybe pushing back against you know the animal free stuff. So I guess it's kind of like, do we somehow need to get to a point where we convince them that this is actually a good thing, mm-hmm. so that they they kind of come on board with us rather than continually fight against us. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I wish I could say that I didn't think they'd fight against us. I think they will, right? Uh, we just have to be ready for the fight. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm thankful that I'm surrounded by lots of people who are, you know, who are ready for the fight um, to, to create positive change in the world. Um, you know, even even in this in our small little space of the pet food industry, uh, we've already had uh, several larger pet food companies uh, and, and I won't name which ones, but we've had several larger pet food companies pushing back on us, right? This is something that they <laughs> don't want to see. They don't want to see the change that we're bringing in the industry. Of you know, it, you know, like you can't have a non-meat based product and, and that's just really not true, but they're starting to push back. They're starting to publish like little articles, yes. on us, yeah. you know, strange comments on, on blog posts, you know, so, oh, this is bad. It will kill your dog if they yeah. eat it. <laughs> this type of stuff, which is, it's like really strange. And so, you know, we're already feeling the pushback. And I suspect as we get more successful, as we grow, and as we start reducing the consumption of, of uh, animal-based proteins, uh, instead for, for wild earth uh, proteins, for koji proteins, we're probably going to get that pushback. But I think that ultimately, um, we're on the right side of history. And yeah. so I'm ready for the fight. Like we, myself, my team, you know, it's a mission for us. This is not just about creating a company. This is a mission to transform the world for the better. And so I think other entrepreneurs, just like myself, just like you, um, are out there and they're, they're going to they're gonna fight for, for the positive vision they see of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. I think it's a wonderful note to end on. As I said, I, I don't think we need the biotechnology to clone you, but I'm hoping we'll get more and more you know, people like yourself. It really gives me heart to know that there are business people and entrepreneurs um, like you doing this amazing stuff. You shared some wonderful intel and I think certainly your listeners are going to be very inspired. So thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show, Ryan. It's been a real mm-hmm. pleasure. Thank you, Katrina. Lo- love your work and, and please continue to fight the good fight. Thanks for everything. So that was Ryan Bethancourt, vegan biohacker, investor, and co-founder of Wild Earth. You can find out more at wildearthpets.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 102. Now for our vegan business news roundup. Beyond Meat, creators of the plant-based Beyond Burger, sausages and other vegan products, has announced plans to expand across six continents this year. The company, whose investors include Bill Gates and Leonardo DiCaprio, is one of the leading players in next-generation vegan burgers that bleed with beet juice and mimic animal protein in other ways. I interviewed Ethan Brown, the founder, recently for a Forbes article I wrote called Should Vegan Products Be Sold Alongside Meat and Dairy Items in Retail Stores? And he told me that the company's sales had doubled last year and will do the same this year. He also said that the Beyond Burger was the number one selling beef patty in the meat case at all stores in the Southern California division of a major mainstream retailer in the five weeks up to 17 April. That's 2018 if you're listening in the future. Since launching the Beyond Burger in 2016, the company has sold 13 million of them and its products are available in more than 27,000 grocery stores and restaurants across the US. 
Beyond Meat has partnered with a select group of distributors to enter more than 50 countries this summer, including Germany and the rest of Europe, Canada, Australia, Mexico, Chile, Israel, UAE, Korea, Taiwan and South Africa. Now, of course, there's divided views as to whether these types of products should be placed in the meat case or in a separate natural or healthy channel. And I explore this more in my Forbes article, which I'll put a link to in the show notes page. But these sales figures and expansion plans are great news as it opens this category up to gain even greater reach, particularly among mainstream or as I like to call them pre-vegan consumers. A hospital in the northwest of England in the UK is adding an extensive vegan menu to its offering to patients, reports the Lancashire Telegraph. East Lancashire Health Trust is planning to offer dishes such as quinoa with stir-fried vegetables and a Cajun spiced vegetable bean burger. And according to Tim Radcliffe, catering manager at the Trust, in the near future, these options will be supplemented by a range of in-house prepared vegan salads that have been successfully trialled, including roast cauliflower, falafel salad with aubergines, and a chickpea nut and cranberry salad. The plans for the vegan menu were announced on NHS, that's National Health Service, Sustainability Day, an initiative that the Vegan Society in the UK is also on board with, having launched its own campaign that aims to ensure the needs of vegans are met in public sector institutions and that more vegan options are served on public sector menus. Radcliffe said, The trust is focused on improving the whole patient experience, and food plays a very important role in that. So this is brilliant news. It's about time hospitals stopped serving people who, let's face it, are typically there because they're ill, food that's bad for their health. And it's so good that they're starting to understand the benefits of plant-based eating. And if you're an entrepreneur in this space, it's probably worthwhile getting on the radar of health trusts or organisations in your own area and country to see if there's potential for collaboration. Finally, a vegan photographer has been hired to shoot the upcoming wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in the UK on the 19th of May. Again, that's 2018 if you're listening in the future reports plant-based news. Polish prince Aleksi Lubomirski has been chosen to photograph the royal wedding. The professional photographer announced the job on his social media channels where he doesn't shy away from spreading the vegan message. He's previously celebrated Norway's ban on fur farms on Instagram to his 168,000 followers, as well as sharing pro-vegan imagery with hashtags such as go vegan. Now, whether you're into the royal wedding or not, it's pretty good news that both the photographer and the bride are outspoken about animal welfare. It also goes to show that standing up for your beliefs can not only not necessarily be a setback for your career, it can actually be an advantage, particularly when your clients share similar values. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more free resources as well as details of how we can work together to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. And I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now.